the particle caches, uh, something that most of you are actually familiar with and you know how to use them, but since this is fundamental, so I'm going to go, uh, go a little bit to that. I'll load the scene that has Krikatoa already set up here with the typical Buddha statue that we often render. And um, I'm going to open the user interface again. Uh, the user interface closes whenever a new scene gets opened, so the settings would be refreshed correctly when you open. And currently, inter uh, iterative mode is on, and the caches uh, are not populated. So you see there is a gray color in between. And in fact, if I click on this gray color, it's going to go through the memory channels well out, and I'll um, see if I can... Uh, load this guy here on the side, so I have information about what the channels are. In the main controls, um, if I render now the frame, it's going to, I'll move this so you see it, uh, it's going to load the particles, drag the particles, load the particles, play the light to spotlights, and then render a metallic looking Buddha statue. Uh, this process took 7.7 uh, .7 seconds and it's 2.8 million particles. Now, by default, Cricket stores, stores those particles in memory and keeps them there. So we just finished rendering the frame, but in fact, if you right click the pcache button, the memory is still full with those particles. So it doesn't release them by default, and it's because the option keep last frame in cache is checked by default. Uh, and this is how crypto ships. So the idea is you rendered some frame, and then you say, hmm, that looks good, that's exactly the number of particles, 2.8, that I want to have. I'm going to lock these particles, and I'm going to tweak some settings. Uh, so if I press this button, uh, now the cache is locked, and that means that next time I hit the render button, uh, I'm going to just light the particles and draw the particles, and that took only 3.4 seconds because the process of generating the particles was skipped. They were already in memory. What I can also do is I can enable the L cache button, which says the lighting pass for this is also okay. I like the lighting, so I'm going to hit this button, and the green color tells me that all the channels that I currently need for the current feature uh, like everything that is currently enabled as an option is there in the cache. The lighting is there, I hit the button and I get my rendering in much shorter time, in this case 0 0.8 seconds. Uh, some of the settings that you have, for example the density, can be modified independently from the cache, that means even though the particles are in memory, I can hit the button and I'm going to get less density in 0 0.8 seconds, even though I modified settings there. This is not true for all the settings, of course. If you want to change the look of the lighting, the lighting density, for example, uh, if you uh, hit the render button, that's not really going to do much because the lighting cache is locked and you're going to get exactly the same lighting each time. But if we assume that what we are after is actually an animation of this cloud with this density, uh, as it is, and this with this lighting, and the only thing that is changing is the camera. I have some camera move here, and I could uh, potentially go and start rendering really fast uh, with those caches on, and with the iterative mode off. Uh, this one forces me to save, uh, to render a single frame without animation, and uh, doesn't save to disk. If I uncheck this one, right click the render button, say that I want a frame range from 0 to 100, and I want to specify the render path, I'll go and create something like uh, Krikatoa 2 webinar, and I'm going to save here um, statue something.exr. So this is my output, and I can hit the button, and it will start rendering uh, this book statue at about 0 0.9 uh, uh, seconds per frame, and it's rendering a moving camera over time. And that means that right now I'm not generating particles, not lighting particles, I'm only rendering them with a changing camera perspective, which is awesome because it means that you can save a lot of time if your particles are unchanging over a certain animation. Not only that, you can actually do the same on deadline. If you're rendering on the network, you can lock the caches and um, I'm going to stop the rendering now. Also, we don't spend the whole day rendering. 
I'll say cancel, I will have a bunch of frames. And if I right click here, you see that there is a use cache in slave mode option. This is off by default because we don't want you to submit by accident with the caches on to deadline and then you start rendering and your particles stick between frames on the same machine. But if you want to achieve that result, you can submit a job to deadline, enable this option here, and this warns you specifically, hey, I hope you know what you're doing. I won't enable it for now. When you submit the job, the first frame will generate the particles, lock them in cache, and then the, the next, part, uh, the next uh, frames on the same machine, if Max is not releasing uh, the scene, are uh, going to take a fraction of the time because everything is already locked in cache, pre-illuminated and uh, pre-cached. Uh, another thing that you saw here, I don't know if you noticed, but while I was setting the render path, there was this option wasn't there. And this option now appeared because we just rendered a uh, number of frames from this sequence. If I go and say explore path, it's going to open me uh, an explorer and it shows the frames that were saved. We have 37 frames of this animation. And if I right click here and say open rendered frame, I can open it in RAM player, channel A, and this will create an IFL file automatically, load the animation that I just rendered, and I can go and play it back. Um, this is a relatively recent uh, feature that was added to the right click menu. It's a 2.0 uh, Krikatoa feature. Uh, and it's very useful uh, when you start using in the future. Right now you don't have this option. But when you start exporting to Krikatoa standalone, uh, you might want to quickly uh, recall an animation that exists on disk at this path and uh, check it out. You can also open single frames. You can just open a, a viewer and then click on the arrow and see the single frames individually. Uh, and there are um, additional options here to open an external viewer. If you have something assigned, like this is our own internal uh, viewer for anything, which shows image sequences, meshes, particle systems, uh, level sets, and a lot of other things, X meshes. Um, and uh, so there is really no reason, except for changing probably the actual frame range, to actually navigate the render scene dialog. You can navigate with the right click on the render button. You click, and this is going to open the render dialog. And you can go here and say, yeah, I'm going to change my range. Uh, and then you can close it, and when you look here, that range is now as an option. You can switch between 0 to 100 or to the custom range or to a single frame without ever having to wait for this dialog to open and navigate in it. So we try to expose, even assigning render elements, you just click here, render dialog opens in the right place, you assign the render elements and stuff comes. Um, the, there is one case in the caches where, for example, if you go to the globals and you uh, enable the overwrites, uh, an overwrite is something that is going to be cached. So if I overwrite the color to, let's say, some red color, um, you actually s get here a warning that says, well, the cache is valid, and if you had the hit the render button, it's going to render correctly. But the changes that you made to the global settings, overwrite color, change from false to true, and the overwrite color, color, change from white to red, all those settings, if they weren't cached, they're not going to apply unless you disable the cache and uh, recache again. That's what the orange color means. So if I hit the render button again, it's going to render well these overwrites. It's still the, the statue. If I disable the cache and hit the render button, this is going to uh, calculate the path perform the light again, and in about seven seconds, now we get the red color with the override, and now I can lock my caches, and these settings um, apply. In some cases, if you hit the button that requires an additional channel, for example, the normal channel, I say I want environment reflections. It's not actually a normal, so it looks like I have the normals in this case. Let's see what else we don't have. Yeah, velocity is something that we don't have. Well, these particles don't really have a velocity channel, but right now my cache is invalid. It says yellow, invalid cache, because a required channel, which is displayed with a minus here, is currently not in the cache. So you should, if you hit the render button, it's actually going to uh, ignore the state of the two buttons and rebuild all the channels, and then it will go to green, and from that point on, it will be really fast. Okay, let's 
uh, keep on moving. We saw the render button and the setting of time uh, and output without leaving the uh, environment of Krektor. Just right click on the render button. Iterative mode, you saw that one too. Uh, when we hit it, even though a safe path might be specified, an animation might be specified, when it's on, it will render just the current frame. This is something that Max also does, and that's the uh, iterative mode of Max displayed here too. And we have the extended uh, frame buffer controls. I'm really proud of this because it's probably the only feature that Autodesk has ever implemented for me specifically. I begged at SIGGRAPHT for them when they told us that they're going to allow the uh, frame buffer of Max to be extended by renderers, third-party renderers. I said, please, 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 please make it so that it's Max scriptable. And they said, okay, we'll look at it, and then they implemented it as a Max script, so even the, uh, the controls that come with Mentoray and default scanline renderer uh, based on a script. And it was easy for us to add a Krikotor specific script. So when you switch to Krikotor, and if in the preferences the option to use the extensions uh, is enabled, you're going to get pretty much all the controls in the main uh, rollout uh, exposed here. And there is also an additional feature. I'm going to disable the motion blur, and now we're back to green cache. And you know that I can render now without a problem if I hit the button. But uh, let's say that um, I want to uh, tweak the density of this guy interactively. I can go here, right-click the uh, iterative button, and you see that there is a threshold that says if the last rendering took less than a certain amount of time, let's say five seconds, uh, I'm going to enable the interactive mode. So I hit the render once, this will take 0 0.8 seconds, and now I'm actually in interactive mode. Interactive mode means that if I go and start modifying settings, for example, uh, let's say that I want to change this density, I just click the arrow and it re-renders because it knows it's going to take less than the threshold time. Uh, so as long as the last render took less than five seconds in this case, um, any changes that I make, for example, I can go here and say, I'm going to change this color to green, but I haven't enabled it yet. So I say, okay, this is the green color. I go over right background, boink, I have the green color. I don't like this green color. I go and make it blue. The moment I release the mouse, it's already blue. So this is now interactive mode. I don't know how many people have ever used it, but as long as your cache speeds up your workflow, and all the channels are cached, and it takes really short time um, according to the threshold. You can actually just modify settings in the user interface, and the redraw will happen automatically. Um, so I don't have to hit the button all the time. 